Welcome to The Infidel, podcast of the damned, the weekly companion show of the Infidel News. Join us as we discuss this week's religious accounts from an atheist perspective. From Timbuktu to Toledo, from Kathmandu to Canada, from Bangalore to Bangladesh, we deplore, you deride. And here are your hosts, Dave and Nicole. Hello, everybody, and welcome to show number nine of the Infidel Podcast of the Damned. I'm your host, J. David Kaur, atheist, author, and angry archer. And with me is my co-host, Nicole Samard. Hello, Nicole. Hey, how are you? Good. Also joining us today is Jenny McDermott, one of our anchors. Hello, Jenny. Hi. Today's Wednesday, November 5th, 2014, and we're going to be discussing the upcoming episodes of the Infidel News, which will run beginning Monday, November 10th, 2014. So uh, this is uh, actually take two. Uh, we had a little bit of a technical glitch as usual for our show, but we're all good to go now. So um, uh, we, uh, in, in the initial uh, run through, we discussed the um, uh, elections in the United States, but that was a little bit boring. So let's change the subject. Let's talk about Jenny and her uh, uh, current uh, fun that she's having on her channel. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would call it fun per se, but... Um... The other day, The Amazing Atheist uh, posted a video about Anita Sarkeesian's um, speech she was supposed to give at Utah State University, which she um, ended up canceling because it uh, received a death threat, like a, a massacre style death threat. And they actually said, I actually wrote down from the letter, but um, they actually said... I think it was like a Canadian style massacre. What did they say? Oh, Montreal style massacre. The person said in the letter. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I don't know what happened in Montreal that they were. Oh, talking. that was nasty. That was really nasty. Uh, it was a uh, student who uh, decided that you know uh, he was uh, he was against women. And he decided that uh, the reason he was not able to uh, get into a, uh, un a special program, it was an engineering program, was because uh, they were letting in women and uh, giving him special status. So he went in there and uh, started shooting left, right, and center. Mm. Yeah, so, so this person said they had pipe bombs and a semi-automatic we weapon, and they were going to attack a different women's... Um, like a women's club that was somewhere else on campus as well as the place where she was speaking and so she declined to do it and he basically said well that's because you're bullshit you decided not to do this speech because your claim is weak and so i wrote a response that was tj that's what t that's what tj said yeah and his video it's called sarkeesian versus uh marilyn manson and so he um, kind of compared it to like the Columbine um, thing and how people blamed Marilyn Manson for the deaths at Columbine. And so he had to go on stage like a year later in um, it, like somewhere near Columbine, I guess. And it had gotten death threats, but he went on anyway. So he was like, yeah, in life you go on anyways. And like basically like someone shared my video with him. He tore my ass apart but like in the most immature way ever like he's like going ah, ah, like the whole video and then he calls me a bitch and all this so then i made another response where i um dressed like him and i'm sure he is very fond of it yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the the second video that you did was um uh a, a, a you role playing where you played you played both characters you played him and, and but and basically, it's it, it, it's it's um it was a fi what they call a fisking video where you took his actual arguments because the things that you had him saying weren't um uh, they were actually things that he'd said for in, in your in the video about you he he would he had actually said most of those things that you so it wasn't like you were um, straw manning him you were actually saying what he said whereas well and that's the big argument is everyone keeps saying well you just totally straw manned him like right now and I'm like. Really, by acting exactly as he acts and talks, I straw man him as like this bad yeah. person. Like, yeah, there was no straw no. man. You, 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 there were quotes. They were pretty much. I mean, they weren't verbatim right. quotes, Paraphrasing but they were crazy here and there. But yeah, right. technically, like the bitch calling and like saying he hates me and like all this stuff. That was like 
Exactly. Yeah. Even the and stuff most about of the... his arguments were just right. deep and um, I feel like they were more like ad hominem or he'd be like, what research papers? You don't have to pay for research papers, blah, 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 because you have to pay for research papers. Like he yeah. would just be straight <laughs> exactly what I said and yeah. like be yeah. disagreed with me. Yeah, yeah, he was that, that point. That point made no sense. That was him. That was him. He jumped on the fact that you said that um, uh, research paper. You can't. You can't always cite research papers in a in a paper unless you pay for them. And he said basically he was basically saying, well, then you should pay for them. But he didn't really make that point very clear. His because the way he said it was, no, you can always uh, cite them. You just have to pay for them. So, yeah, that is what you said. And and him rephrasing it the way he did just was. It, it was it was it was mostly it was a red herring is what it was it was a red herring and um uh well poisoning i know all the fallacies <laughs> <laughs> i like that you know and honestly th like his show is what it is it's it this is my opinion it's like along the lines of bill o'reilly or rush limbaugh and if you mm -hmm. argue with that opinion then you're a piece of shit and i'm gonna make you look like an idiot so i mean i didn't expect for him to be like, wow, this girl's so pretty and nice, and I like her. I knew he was going to be like, this person's an idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was waiting for that. And and if I ever were invited on a show, which that would be awesome, I wouldn't expect um, an actual like formal de debate of any sort. Like I would expect like a barrage of hate and mm -hmm. um, ad hominem. So yeah, yeah, but uh, um. Just in case there's anybody out there who's not aware of what the root of this was, it's, it uh, goes back to Gamergate, uh, which is um, another one of those um, uh, little kerfuffles that's been blown up into a big thing. Um, Anita Sarkeesian basically was uh, criticizing video games for being sexist and violent, uh, and uh, people uh, criticized her because video games are sexist and violent, but so what? <laughs> was their was their was their argument, and Anita Sarkeesian never said um, video games are violent and and sexist, so they should be done away with. She was right. just she was just saying, they're be aware they're violent and sexist, and if you're in, involved with it, you need to you you need to be aware of that Canada and is consider the other for its water and uh, and in your videos, you even have made made the point you're not trying to get them banned, you're not trying to get them taken off the market, you just want people to know. Uh, that there's there there are issues involved with it. it it's the same. It's like the um, there was a video that was popular this week with the with the girl walking around town wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and people were catcalling her. And uh, and 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 a lot of people came on and they said a lot of those guys were just being nice. Well, they were a lot of the guys were being nice, but it was still unwelcome, unnecessary, and they would not have said those same things. Those these guys who were saying to these girl to this girl, there was there was there were just, some of them were just saying, "Hi, have a nice day." There was another person on the street right along beside her. They didn't say a word to that person. So, right. <laughs> you know, it was because she was attractive, and that's why they were doing it. And it was, it was, it was, which, is, which is just that's human nature, and it's going to happen. But there's nothing, and there's nothing wrong with calling attention to it. But she was making it, you know, it is, it, it is valuable to let people know this is what happens when a girl goes out on the street. Men don't think about that kind of thing. We just don't. So it's just a matter of being aware. It's like it's like um, white privilege. It's like when. Um, did you see? Did you see where? Did, did either of you see um, uh, John Stewart arguing white privilege with Bill O'Reilly? No, yeah. I didn't. Yeah, he didn't. Bill O'Reilly could not understand what the hell he was talking about. And he, <laughs> it was, oh, and he surprise, kind of surprise! And then he, he agreed kind of with him. And, and then, then later, he, Russell Brand shows him, and he's almost like agreeing again with the white privilege thing. So I feel like, and this is another thing about Bill O'Reilly is that I read once that since he's like a Harvard graduate and all this. If someone said he is like the biggest case of devil's advocate there is like he it's like a conspiracy theory but they were like he is there to like show society that this is not how you're supposed to be like you're supposed to get from bill o'reilly that that is bad and be better than that and i think it was like a funny article or something but yeah. i always hold on to that you know and I yeah know. they say the same thing about rush limbaugh rush limbaugh whenever some whenever he's Whenever he's um, um, got an audience that is in favor of him, he, call, he, he, like, he, he talks his political points. When he has an audience that's not in favor of him, he calls himself an entertainer <laughs> you know, and tries to use that as an out, like an excuse for he can, he can say whatever he wants. He's just an entertainer. He, you know, like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cop-out is what it is when they do that. But. With the 
catcalling thing, I, I made a video once about yes, all women, and I was just explaining the hashtag for people who like didn't know or whatever. And there happened to be some guys on a boat in the background. Like I usually don't film outside the home, but at that point in time, I was going to the beach a lot. And these guys on this boat were just like, woo, the whole time. Yeah. And it was like in the video, I'm like, man, I'm going to have to start over, edit this out. Well, my boyfriend's like, keep it, you know, keep it. Who cares? It's funny, you know? And then I got this reaction from all these men's rights movements that are like, you staged this. This is misandry. Like, how can you do this? But the fact of it is this lady commented, and there's this thing called Lewis's Law. And there was this writer, woman, her last name's Lewis. She went to Oxford. She says that in every feminist film, every feminist, whatever, blog, article, you can see the need for feminism in the comments alone. Just people attacking yeah. and saying like disgusting things. And like, I feel like this is almost like sort of what happened with TJ. Like, like he is proving that I, we need feminism because in my original video, I have like a mild amount of authority in my voice. And he's like, she is a bitch. And in my next <laughs> video, I'm like, he's so sweet. I love <laughs> he is. And he's like, oh, I love this chick. Like, she's awesome. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, I'm not allowed to be opinionated or something. Yeah, that, that's the problem with, with the problem with privilege, whether it's white privilege, whether it's male privilege, whatever, whatever the privilege is. And I'm guilty of it. And I'm sure Nicole's been guilty of it. We, you, it, it yeah, sure. you guys, I well, love you guys. I'm perfect. <laughs> I'm perfect. But what happens is what, what happens is you fall into a mindset where you just certain things are given and you just expect them. And when every once in a while you'll catch yourself doing something. And it's but it's, it becomes a problem when people refuse to acknowledge that they are. I I, I don't care who it, who it is. If we, if it was if we lived in Amazon Amazonia and uh, the and women were in control, then it would then women would have the privilege and they would be the ones abusing it every once in a while. People that have privilege abuse privilege. It's just a it's just the nature of the beast. So when you're talking about privilege, calling it out, there's a, there's an expression that gets used on Tumblr all the time. Check your privilege. It's just a matter of it's just, it's just it's just it's just if somebody you'll be saying something without realizing it that that is that that demonstrates your privilege and somebody will say to you check your privilege and all you have to do with when somebody says it to you if you think about why they're telling you that and try to look at it from the other side and if you can't see it from the other side you know if you look at it from the other side and really can't see it then maybe it's not a fair a fair thing but it, usually you can see it you can see where when you why with something that you said why they called you? Why they told you to check your privilege? Usually, you can see that. Now, there have been other times. There, there was a. I'll give you one example with me. There was a, there was an example where Selena Gomez. You know who that is? Yeah. Both of you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, she went on a show uh, uh, wearing a bindi, and um, she got called out by um, Hindu women uh, uh, as um, for appropriation. Uh, where she was, um, you're not a Hindu. You shouldn't be wearing the bindi. Uh, that's that's appropriation. And she didn't check her privilege. <laughs> she, she, and and she went on the next the next two public appearances she made, she wore a bindi again, and and said and said screw you, I'm gonna wear the bindi. Now, um, I understand what they're t what they're what they're saying about appropriation, but I also understand why, from her point of view, she really wasn't doing it. She wasn't. She's she's Hispanic, you know. She's a Hispanic girl, who who has had things handed to her and doesn't understand privilege the way other people do because she thinks privilege should be working against her, you know, but, but she actually has privilege and doesn't, doesn't recognize it. So, uh, uh, but I, uh, mentioned on, on Tumblr, I said, look, trying, trying to explain it from her point of view, I, I said, um, uh, the Prince William, uh, or Prince, Prince Charles has, um, worn a kilt. He's not Scottish, you know. I on St. Patrick's Day, black people wear the green. They're not Irish, you know. Every time Obama some, is, oh, Obama is, yeah. Oh, apostrophe Obama. But yeah. no, no, but he is partly. He's partly Irish through his mother. Did you know that? I, I don't. I don't know what his, what his mother's background is. I have but, a um, too. Can I tell it? Go ahead. Um. <laughs> Hey, Nicole. Yeah. You want to hear a joke about Ebola? 
Okay. Let, you uh, won't get it. Oh, yeah? You won't get it. That's the punchline. Oh. <laughs> groan, groan, groan. That's pretty good. I like that. Yeah. Um, anyway, to, to finish my, to finish my, um, my, my, my Vindy point. So um, a Hispanic girl on the site who, who because I was defending uh, Selena Gomez for not understanding that she had privilege, even though she was Spanish, got irate with me for saying that a Spanish person could have privilege. So some, you can't always see the, the lines. The lines do get blurred sometimes. And, it, and, and, and so for men not to recognize what their privilege is in this particular case, they, they just need to be, and it doesn't have to be a battle. It doesn't have to be, there don't have to be death threats over it. If, if, you're, if you're so pissed off about it to the point that you're, you're making death threats or calling somebody a bitch or saying you should be raped or, or any of that, check your privilege. <laughs> I love how ghetto it sounds. That's <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like it. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, moving on. Uh, our anchor today is Mr. E. Uh, this will be his last time anchoring the news for Atheism TV. He's moving on to other things. Um, so uh, we all want to uh, thank him for his service. Uh, nobody on nobody on Atheism TV, not the anchors, not the writers, not the producer, nobody is, is, is compensated financially um, for our work. So he, everything that he's done is, was volunteer. So we appreciate his time and everything that he did for the channel. And, uh, and uh, so when you're watching him today, um, uh, just respect. That's all. Um, and, so, uh, and I'd invite anybody who watches uh, us uh, through my channel to leave a good comment to uh, him, uh, telling him how good a job he did and to thank him. Yes. And also, uh, one thing that uh, ha has come up in his life uh, over the last year is that he started a band, or he's part of a band, and so he plays the keyboard, and uh, they seem to be uh, having a lot of success uh, out there in uh, Australia, where he lives, in case anybody did not recognize his accent. And uh, he's having a lot of success and is uh, being very, very busy out there. Does he play didgeridoo? Uh, that I haven't asked. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to ask him. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, show, Ms. show Mr. E's first story. In the recent Synod of Bishops assembled in Rome to discuss and present the position of the Church on issues like family values and traditional family, Pope Francis was hoping to bring about changes to the Catholic Church's position towards homosexuality. However, the Conservative Bishops brought their collective down. The document, the original document presented during the Synod, said homosexuals had gifts and qualities to offer. It also asked if Catholicism could accept gays and recognize positive aspects of same-sex couples. In a dramatic change in tone from that past, it said that the Church should challenge itself to find a fraternal space for homosexuals without compromising Catholic doctrine. While Roman Catholic gay rights groups around the world hailed the paper as a breakthrough, Conservative bishops condemned it as a betrayal of church teaching and said its language had, had sowed confusion among the faithful. At the time, the Vatican stressed that the paper was still a work in progress and a definitive version would be issued after the Synod. Cardinal Raymond Burke from the United States accused the committee that prepared the text of having railroaded the assembly. He said it did not reflect the consensus position of the Catholic Church and demanded changes. Burke, claiming that the document wasn't a position many of the bishops accepted, demanded that Pope Francis issue a clear statement defending his idea of traditional marriage and family. To the Pope's embarrassment, the Conservatives won out, and the Catholic gay groups were left very disappointed. The final version of this document will now serve Catholics around the world over in the next 12 months and will be the cornerstone of a second and final synod of, on the family that will take place sometime next year. And the Pope loses again. He has to step back. You know, he tries to move forward, to, you know, to bring the church forward in the new 21st century, and then uh, the conservatives push him back into the 19th. Yeah. The, um... I read... Go ahead. Oh, oh, sorry. There you go. <laughs> 
Oh, well, I read about it on um, Catholic, what was it called? The National Catholic Reporter. And they actually, in the article I read, they had a confession for it and everything. Like, they were showing the other side and how there's um, a lot of different, um, like, not bishops, but what am I thinking? Oh, like the Austrian cardinal um, disliked it, and then um, the Vatican spokesperson was also against it because basically they changed it from... <laughs> welcoming to homosexual persons to providing for homosexual persons, pretty much. Providing for? Yeah, it, it, their whole thing was, this is their argument. It was originally written in Italian, and so now we need to translate it. And I actually looked at the writing in Italian, and it says, um, like, something that is similar to Spanish for, like, providing or fraternal something like that, so more of like a brotherhood or like, I don't know, rather than, you know, welcome them and... Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that um, the, uh, the language thing with the, with the church is, is always a, always a problem, you know, which is why they always want to do everything in Latin, because that way, uh, uh, if you're if everything's done in Latin, or, and if the, the, that's one reason why the conservatives wanted wanted, wanted um, the official language of the church to stay Latin, because if you're starting with Latin, then everybody can translate out from the same thing. But if you're starting with English, then translating it to Italian, or starting with Italian, sometimes translating out to English, you get different things. But if you're but if but if it's Latin, everybody everybody can go back to the Latin and get the original meaning. But the Bible itself was is you know the the um, you got, you got the Hebrew, then the Synoptic Greek, and then the uh, Latin Vulgate, and then the and then the English, and so it's it's been translated so many times that the, the whole the, the root of it is is lost. So uh, uh, that makes a good point, but it's not a, it's, it's not a valid reason to uh, you know change the policy. No. Uh, they basically said on the Catholic Reporter, like the the person who wrote the article was just like, yeah, way to water down like your acceptance of homosexuality, you know, way to go. Yeah. Yeah. And the, well, thing is, the thing is, though, like, among the, uh, uh, the priesthood and uh, there is a lot of homosexuals. Yeah. There's a lot of them, and they are just betraying the, their own. Yeah. Yeah. Catholic, I mean, they, like, there are a lot of Catholic priests who, like, in confession, Will will tell uh, the, tell their confessor that, about you know sinful gay thoughts that they've had. They they supposedly they're not acting on, but um, but then again you know supposedly the heterosexuals aren't acting on them either. And how many pregnant nuns have there been? So, <laughs> so but um, uh, there it makes it's um, there there are going to be a lot of gay people are more drawn even even if you're if you if you have no intention of ever acting on your sexual impulses, gay people. Gay men are going to be more drawn to the priesthood than heterosexual men because there's that element of shame and, and a desire to, uh, you know, have purpose that you can't have in the Catholic Church. You can't have it through marriage. So, you know, that's what. So, of course, there's going to be a lot of gay priests. And um, as, and it, it, it might be a little bit of an actual um, – uh, I don't want to assume anything, but it could be um, uh, uh, sour grapes. <laughs> you know they they don't want they don't want to welcome gay uh, people into the into the into the family of the church because they didn't get to act out on it. So why should these people get to act out on it? Right. Except that, that, that in Rome, uh, supposedly, the gay priests are very active in the uh, gay clubs uh, of the in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah. In Rome, I think. Uh, um, uh, look at the look at the Borgias. The Borgias, you know, if you go if you go all the way back, the, the priesthood has never been what 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 the, what lay people in the Catholic Church think it is. It's never been that. Um, so um, yeah, it's not surprising that, that that that's going on in Rome, especially where you know I'm, I'm sure it's also going on a lot in um, Paris and Greece, and uh, probably more than in a lot of the United States and Canada, just because of the of the um, uh, European attitude toward it well i'm just checking something you know there have been you know uh, popes that had children i believe mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Most so, of the Borgias. Most of the Borgias did. There was like three or four Borgia popes, and they all had kids. So, you know, yeah. Somehow they got the idea that uh, the best thing to do was to le uh, live a life of uh, denial of everything, and it had to be on like that for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, the, the ones who really suffer end up suffering for this are are families with gay members and and gay Catholics. Those they're the ones that suffer because the conservatives in the church refuse to come into the 21st century with the rest of the world. Yep. Yeah. And it's mostly South America and um, uh, um, uh, some of the more repressed parts of Europe that are, that are, that are the problem. Now the, yeah. the thing is one, th uh, like I, I used to be a Catholic myself and me too. Me too. And the thing is uh, there was one time where I know that, uh, and the priest knew that he was, Giving the final rites, uh, what that's the word we give, uh, you know, for the final, uh, or you know, he gave, uh, uh, he did a mass for the somebody who had just died, who had died of AIDS and was gay, and uh, he would could have been in trouble with the, uh, you know, the uh, archdiocese if they had found out. Well, so, did he get? Did, did the gay person get last rites? Get ex extra unction? Uh, I believe he did. So all the, all the all the priest has to say is that he repented. Mm hmm But at least a, uh, you know, you know he he did something for somebody who was uh, who was openly gay. I think a, a lot of uh, priests uh, will do things like that, but they don't want to uh, have things uh, out in the open and uh, to make their way to the archdiocese. Mm hmm yeah, well, that's that. Yeah, the politics, the politics in the Catholic Church, is second only to the politics in the in the Muslim world. It's you know the there 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 are places in the world where a Catholic can't say anything that goes against the prevailing Catholic ideas, even if it's not the um uh, the the um the the official prevailing ideas because the, the, you can you like like I was mentioning before in South America in South America there are uh, a, a lot of exorcists and um, uh, people who believe in demonic possession and uh, if you if there are parts of uh, uh, down there where, where if you if you speak out against demonic possession and talk about um, just mental health um, it, you know it's it, you're going to, it, it's politically bad for you uh, within the Catholic Church even even though the Roman Catholic Church recognizes it well, one thing that few people realize is that uh, the Catholic Church, the Pope, has the, uh, one of the biggest uh, spy agency in the whole world. <laughs> you know. Yeah. He, it's just, uh, basically I read the Da Vinci agency. Code. There, there are, he's got priests <laughs> throughout the entire world, and they all report to him, telling him everything that's going on in the smallest part of their, you know, of the their mm -hmm. countries. Yeah. So he's got a spy agency. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Is that where these like Sidon um, bishops are? Hmm? Is that what these bishops are that that write the the Sidon document? Well, it's just that the, the, uh, you know all the priests, the, the bishops, etc. They all report to the Pope, telling him what's going on, what's the status in their and their diocese. So the thing is, you know. Like uh, when you want to spy on another country, you want to know what's going on in the smallest towns and everywhere in the smallest parts of those countries. You want to know what's going on. You want the pulse of the country. The Pope's mm -hmm. got it from every country in the world. Yeah, and they've got and they've got a system in place too with the confessional, because you have um, you'll have a kid come in, um, a, a, a nine year old kid will come in and uh, feel feel guilty about something that his uh, that he did. That his that his dad maybe because of something that his dad did and he'll, and and like say for example he's confessing that uh, uh, he um, disobeyed his father because his father told him to steal something so now the priest knows that the father is a thief so now that now that priest goes to his confessor and tells his confessor uh, 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 what happened and then that confessor goes to the bishop and then that bishop goes to the cardinal and then it gets all wow. the way up to the <laughs> that's a great idea. 
<laughs> Those guys, they were thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, anyway, so let's go on to the next story before uh, t- before we uh, beat this dead horse too much. Okay. Story number two. Convicted in the state of California for possession of methamphetamine eight years ago, 46-year-old Barry Hazel Jr. spent a year incarcerated for the offence. In 2007, he was released on a parole, a condition which included mandatory attendance to meetings of a 12-step addiction recovery program. Hazel, who is an atheist, objected to the faith-based program administered by Westcare, a company hired by the state to oversee Hazel's mandated recovery protocols. Hazel requested a transfer to a different facility which might offer a non-religious alternative, and he refused to attend the meetings which required that he acknowledge the existence of a higher power. The state considered this a parole violation and ordered Hazel back to prison where he served an additional 100 days in conditions described by his attorney, John Heller, as dangerous and overcrowded. Hazel and Heller sued the state and Westcare for violating Hazel's constitutional rights and the man was awarded close to two million by the Ninth Circuit Court. Said Heller, he stood up for his constitutional rights when many others would have just gone along and in doing that he paid a heavy price. As a result of the case, the state of California now offers all non-believers who are required to enter the recovery program a secular alternative to AA and NA. Okay, yeah, now that I'm kind of conflicted on that particular story because on the one hand, I'm, I agree with his stance and I'm glad that California changed their position. On the other hand, the guy was, is being hailed as like a champion amongst atheists and he was a methamphetamine dealer. That's what he, that's what, that's what he is. He's a meth dealer. He's not. He's not like you know. We're not talking about uh, somebody. Somebody who was just uh, you know refused to say the pledge of allegiance and was put in jail. He was a meth dealer, and they told him to go to AA, um, and he refused for good reason, and had to do a hundred more days in jail. That he deserved a hundred. Not not because he refused, but he deserved. He was a meth dealer. He deserved to do the hundred days. He doesn't deserve two million dollars. I'm sorry. He does. Right. I want two million dollars. I know. You know, I had my little stint with alcoholism there when I was younger and I would drink and stuff. And I quit about three years ago and I went to an AA meeting. I went to two and I was like, wow, for being secular, you sure all talk about God the entire time. And at the end, you make us hold hands and pray and basically pray. We don't say like, dear God or anything. And so I stopped going because I was like, this is extremely uncomfortable for me. And in looking into it, I found out that the the two founders of the group um, also belong to the Oxford group, which is a largely Christian group. Um, So I feel like maybe they stole things here and there um, and added them in. There was a bunch of like conspiracy theories about um, L. Ron Hubbard having a part in that because he started like Narconon, but um, I don't think they're true. Just, you know, it just feels culty being there. It's uncomfortable. It makes me want to drink, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's been that way for years, though. AA, AA has always been um, a, uh, a religious organization. Uh, and, uh, they're, they're, and and there's never, as there's never been an alternative. There, for a long time, there were no alternatives for uh, for non-religious people, but they did, they have come up with a number of alternatives recently for non-religious people where they don't actually require you that they don't have the 12 steps. They don't require you to acknowledge a higher power. They don't require you to pray. They don't require you to give over your power, which is what they do in a, yeah, they don't, you know, that stuff doesn't, if you, because, because it's not going to work for you if you don't believe it. It's just, there's no sense in it. Like three years ago on Facebook, I started a group called Atheist Alcoholics Anonymous, and it has a big flying spaghetti monster on the page. But I got like one follower, so I never really went through with it. But I posted a bunch of articles about that, that there are these groups, you know, all around the United States that get together and they promote, you know, belief in yourself and 
you know, exercise and eating healthy and like doing like gardening and things like that, that might, you know, help you to grow or, you know, just put that like need to drink on something else. But mm -hmm. yeah. See, that's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering if this guy, when they told him to go to, when he had, that he had to go to AA meetings, if he couldn't have just checked himself into a different sobriety center and a different um, like program that was secular, if he if he would have had to go to jail, right? You know, so I he, don't know if he offered them any options. They just they, they said, "Here's I'm not the, the program, and you you know you got to go through that program." Yeah, I'm not saying they offered him any. I'm saying that if he had made the effort to do it himself, if they would have even bothered to put him in back yeah. in jail. Oh yeah, I think it's odd too because people who have had meth addiction. This was like an observation I made that I later looked into because I'm from a town that is very messy and everyone is crazy religious there and super Christian and they're all like ex meth addicts and like Missy Teeth and stuff. And so I actually like did some research on it and it, there's a really high number of people that um, they sort of suffer from a brain damage brought on by meth addiction that that pushes them towards believing that there's an entity you know or yeah. that they have a a relationship with the something you know supernatural being so mm -hmm. i'm surprised that he doesn't believe in god yeah <laughs> personally i'm not sure he deserved uh, those two million dollars no no it was it was a hundred days in jail after he'd already served what was it, a year so I mean, it, it, it's a, if that wasn't a violation of his constitutional rights, he 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 did violate his probation because he didn't make any effort to go to, um, you know, a, 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 like a a, a um, treatment center, and he could have found one if he'd have tried. So, yeah, the, I mean, the state was definitely wrong. I'm not saying the state was not wrong, and it, and it's and it's a good thing that they're now giving them uh, giving the option, but I just don't think I, I don't I really don't think he deserved two million dollars. I really don't. Well, in the future now, they're, uh, they're going to have more options for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that's at a good least thing. It's got, it, there's some good that came out of it. Yeah, there's a lot of good that came out of it for, for uh, you know, peripherally. But his particular case is what I'm looking yeah. at. And, uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Last one. Number story. three. A woman in Lawton, Oklahoma, recently went to a restaurant where she ordered food and some drinks. She partook of the fare, and when the bill arrived, she claimed that her husband would be along shortly to pay in cash for her bill. However, when questioned about the identity of her husband, she replied it was Jesus Christ. Now, as far as most people are concerned, Jesus was either a fictional character or features in the New Testament, or was the Son of God. But in this instance, he failed to show up and settle up for this lady, and the issue of a hefty bill still remains. Christy Rines claimed that she was the bride of Jesus under the eyes of the law, but when Jesus failed to show and settle the bill at the El Chico Mexican restaurant in Lawton, she was arrested and charged with fraud since she couldn't pay her bill. Despite her claim that she, was, that she and Jesus were legally married, she didn't have the marriage license to prove it. Officers who arrived at the scene said Ryans did not appear to be intoxicated or belligerent as she discussed the situation with authorities. Would Jesus skip out on paying for a meal, or was it Christy Ryan's last supper? Okay, that, I don't think that was the story that we were planning on on doing, but that's a good story too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, the uh, the woman, you know. I don't understand. I can't understand from the story whether she actually believes what she was saying or whether she was trying to get away with a fraud. Like I really can't tell from any. I couldn't tell from the uh, any of the background material or, or or from what she was what she was saying. Um, it, it, if 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 she actually believes it that she was that she's married to Jesus and he was going to come along and pay the bill, then she shouldn't have been arrested. She should have been institutionalized. <laughs> but if. Um, if if she was just saying that to try to get out of a bill, that's the stupidest con ever. Well, that, that's what? like what happened? She was in a restaurant and this happened. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah she yeah. went she, to the restaurant and then she, uh, you know, mm -hmm. had a whole meal and everything. And then after that, she she said, uh, uh, "My husband's going to drop by later on and pay for the whole thing. He's coming soon." 
He's got to pay the bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she didn't have a penny on her. Yeah. So that's that's also he also drives her car for her, I'm sure. Yes, so. exactly. They actually arrested her, though? Yeah. I can never. I mean, I've chased down people as a waitress. And yeah, but she doesn't didn't she even have any for. money to pay. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it, it's, it sounds like she was just playing playing crazy so that they would let her go. That's what it sounds like. Like, oh, that woman's just nuts. She thinks Jesus is going to pay for her bill. Don't don't bother with her. But, yeah, I mean, cause, because but the but the only two options are she was either crazy and she should be institutionalized or she was committing fraud. Those are the only. I those think are the only two everyone options. who goes to restaurants is crazy. <laughs> just from on my side of things, like every <laughs> single person is like insane. But, um, yeah, I can see that. Uh, I wanted to bring up a, a, a uh, something that uh, one of our uh, viewers uh, uh, has uh, just mentioned regarding the previous story. Uh, the the man who uh, w actually went to the the meetings, but according to the people there, he became passive aggressive, and that's why he was c considered in violation. Oh. oh, oh, so he actually did attend the meeting. Yeah. Oh. Well, okay, that's different. And, and if he was passive aggressive, it was because he was saying, um, "This is bullshit," and so he was right. Yeah. So now he now okay now he deserves two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to. We like him now. Now I like him. <laughs> so I want to thank uh, Beth uh, for bringing that up to uh, to our attention. Yes. Thank Are you. more people writing things? Well, yeah, we've got yeah we've got people in the in the in the audience this time. Uh, yes. talk. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Glad to see you all. Yeah. Um, We've got uh, six people today. Six people. Yeah. Which is which is four more the, than than our biggest audience in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, they're probably all people Jenny invited uh, on her <laughs> Facebook on her Facebook page. Hi, mom. <laughs> So we've got two of them saying hello. We've got microbloganism and Beth. Very good. So, so, um, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the uh, Christian Glitches story. Okay. It might be a bit long, but, it, well, it's a bit over a minute. And it has, I brought, I did, picked that one because it, uh, it's linked in with the elections uh, yesterday. It uh, features David Barton, the great historian, uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, he's talking about the importance of uh, electing a conservative uh, Senate. You look at every decision of righteousness in this land, it comes back to the judges. It doesn't come back to the legislature, doesn't come to the House, the Senate, or the President, it comes to the judges. Judges, understand you're sitting in the place of God when you make a decision. You make the same decision he would make. If you want God to bless your land, you better have a judge that makes the same because you're judging in the, in the state of God. You, you do what God wants done because you're minister. That's why three times in Romans 13, twice in verse 4, once in verse 6, he says that those that are in civil government are ministers of God. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. they rule yeah. in that position. And, and so for us as, as believers, if we want our land to be blessed, it won't be blessed without righteousness. And if you want righteousness, it comes to the judges. It's the only way you're going to get it. So as we're coming up with elections about to come on us, for a Christian, for any biblical person, we should step back and say, all right, what can I do in this election that will improve the judiciary? What can I do that will improve the judges? Because that's where righteousness comes from. And the answer to that is the Senate. The Senate is what determines the judge. They're the ones that confirm or reject judges. They have the final say on whether those judges go on the court or off the court. And so, oh, I, you know, I don't like voting. I don't want to get involved. Well, if you want righteousness in the land, you better get involved. You better look at the Senate races in your state, and you better figure out which of these persons running for Senate is going to give you the best set of judges. Because if you want God to restore the land, you've got to start with judges, and that's a key to it. Yeah, well, okay, Mr. Barton, that's a valid point from your point of view. But for the rest of us who live in the real world, <laughs> That's just wackadoo. So, you know, he has, you know, he wanted to encourage people to uh, elect conservatives so that 
there's going to not be just conservatives, but evangelicals. Yeah, evangelicals. Yeah. Absolutely, you got me there. So he wanted to fund these uh, in the Senate so that uh, they can elect, uh, fund the uh, judges, and uh, then after that, you know, overturn everything re regarding, uh, you know, uh, gay marriage and anything like that. And well, the Bible's in favor of slavery, so there goes the Fourteenth Amendment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's, all of it's gone. All of it's gone. Yeah. But I thought that was appropriate uh, based on uh, the weekend, uh, the, the great uh, day you had yesterday. Yeah, the great day we had yesterday. Yeah, some of our audience out there are probably Republicans happy with the turnout. I don't, I don't see it myself, but that's fine. Whatever. D didn't go well as far as I can tell. Um, Let's put it this way. As a Canadian... We believe that we consider your uh, Democrats to be like our conservatives, like our le our right wings. So they're not even even your Democrats are not enough left wing enough to qualify that's, as yeah. left in Canada or even center. Yeah, to, that's to true. us they're considered. We consider them as right. Yeah, except for Bernie Sanders. You could you can Bernie Sanders would probably make a good Canadian liberal. Um, but uh, the the problem. Uh, the Senate, uh, usually in in eight year in eight year presidencies in the midterm after six years, it usually the Senate goes to the other party. So if you have a Republican president, you get a Democrat, like we did um, when in Bush's sixth year they elected a Democrat Senate. So it's and and in Clinton's sixth year they elected they elected a Republican Senate. So it's not uh, it's not uncommon to do this, and it's actually in a way it's a good thing, but it makes the president a lame duck. It, that's where the, that's where the term lame duck comes from. And the president he, he's not going to be able to get anything done. All he's going to be able to do is veto um, for the next two years. But the problem is that it sets the next president. If the next president is a Democrat, it sets them up for four years of problems, uh, four, four years of difficulty. And the real problem is. Not so much what happened at the Senate level or even uh, even at the, in the Congress. What happened in, at the local levels is the problem. We lost so many local elections, the Democrats did, and a lot of them were were it were for no good reason. Like they like they, I live in Ohio, and they reelected Kasich, who is anti-union, anti-woman. I mean, he's just he's just been terrible for Ohio, and the, and he was reelected by women, and union members. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. You know, too, about what Nicole was saying, um, there's a really good website called Political Compass. And um, basically, you can, like, fill out a little test about how you feel about things. And it shows you exactly where you're leaning. And it shows you how um, the measurement has moved over so much, where actually the liberals are what a long time ago would be conservative. So it just kind of like moved right over. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then it shows you like what the Dalai Lama was, you know, like was that a good person or, you know, I don't yeah. know, go throughout different dictators and stuff. Yeah, well, if you look, if you look back just, just to the Reagan and, and Nixon era, Nixon established the EPA. Um, uh, Reagan was anti-union, but he did a lot of other things that, that today, if he was, uh, he raised taxes, for example. No conservative in, in Congress today would raise taxes. For the, it, it, it's either cut taxes or do away with taxes. There's no raising taxes. Um, uh, George W. George H. W. Bush raised taxes. Uh, you know, uh, so the, uh, uh, today, what, what most liberals are trying to do is return not to centrism, but to old-fashioned conservatism because that's how far right the the whole pendulum has shifted and it's just really distressing except for on issues like gay marriage where it's really gone and and marijuana use it's really gone left in this country very far you know some people were thinking that uh this uh you know the conservatives are or at least the uh fundies are taking are becoming older and there's uh, and there's more young people coming in and that's going to yeah. help them yeah. there's matters, more there's more doesn't. brown and black people coming in too 
uh, the, 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 um, the Hispanic population and the black population are going to outnumber white people. Old white people are going to die and it's going to, there's going to be a, a paradigm shift. But um, a lot of the Hispanics are, are going um, right and a lot of the young people coming in college are going right too. So the, the, uh, there's, there's really, it's, it's anybody, it, even though there's the, the, the conventional wisdom is that everything's going to go left, it, it, there's, there's, no, there's no knowing. Well, they're hoping because people in school are, I mean, this is what they tell us in college right now, they're getting tech degrees, science degrees, so they're hoping that these people will come out and, you know, will at least be able to influence some people, or they'll be part of corporations that fund, you know, certain people running, so. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. Well, anyway. That's it, um, folks. That's it. So, uh Thanks for um, coming and visiting us for today. Uh, please make sure that you subscribe to the Atheism TV channel. There you can watch the Infidel News for the Damned, where our talented team of writers and anchors present these and other stories not normally covered in the media. In the coming week, the Infidel will rerun today's stories and many more fascinating ones. You'll find Atheism TV at youtube.com slash Atheism TV. The Infidel Podcast of the Damned is a Nicole SD production. Nicole and I would like to recognize and say thank you to Truth Surge, who did the voiceover used in our intro and gave us permission to use music from his song Lied To. We'd also like to thank Jenny for participating in today's podcast. Thanks again, Jenny. You did great. You yeah, always do. Great to have you. Nicole's channel is Nicole SD and can be found at youtube.com slash N-I-C-O-L-S-D. I'm Gamut Man on YouTube, at Gamut Man on Twitter, and my blog and information on my books, including my nonfiction title, Believe It, You Know an Atheist, as well as my mystery novels featuring the atheist detective Lupa Schwartz, can be accessed at tinyurl.com slash Lupa Landing. There you can sign up to receive my newsletter. Signing up also entitles you to choose one free ebook title from my collection of 99-cent novellas. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye.